from London, aren't you, in London at the moment? I'm, I'm in London at the moment, yes. Um, celebrating the release of what, I, what I've been thinking is probably about your 13th book, am I right there? I think it probably is, yes. I, 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 I don't like to count up. <laughs> it's, it's, I think it's the 10th book for adults. Right. So I did three yeah. for teenagers as well, so yes, 13. And, and the ninth in the, there it is, the ninth oh. in the Maeve Kerrigan series. That's right. Which has been going brilliantly, hasn't it? I mean, what's, it's lovely watching a crime series build and build an audience. You know, I think in the publishing industry, we're so used to seeing people just sort of burst in uh, and have these huge, great advances and suddenly, um, you know, the publishing industry has become obsessed with that. And yet, um, a career like yours is has built. I mean, it started well, but you know, like to, for it to carry on building and, and, and building readers is great. Does it feel that way from your end? I mean, it it feels like I've been very lucky. Um, I can say that because I'm sorry, just adjusting my I camera. Moved, yeah, um, I moved to the screen. <laughs> uh, I've been very lucky because I, I started off ten years ago. Um, yeah. So to be doing this for ten years feels, you know, pretty remarkable. Um, and I've had amazing publishers. So I actually switched publishers with this series halfway through, but I was able to take the characters with me, which I yeah. think is really unusual. Um, and both both sets of publishers have been lovely about it and really supportive. So the backlist is still ticking over very nicely and the new books are getting a lot of support. And it is something where, you know, I'm never going to be described as an overnight success, but things are going in the right direction. So. They are, and I think, you know, there's a real value in that because every time you produce a new book like this and as well, you have nine, eight other ones in the Maeve Kerrigan series and the, the missing to, to sell, don't you? Do you know what I mean? You've got a proper backlist to, to go through. Does it work like that? I mean, it does. And actually, one of the things that they did this time, which I think is purely down to the coronavirus, is that they um, the arts pages for the Times were very depleted because obviously there are no events taking place and there aren't as many interviews. Um, and so they decided that they would um, use a, they would serialize the book in the Times for subscribers. So the whole book has been on the in the Times and the Sunday Times. Um, and I've had lots of new readers from that and lots of people getting in touch to say it makes such a change just to read something that's not about viruses and epidemics and, you know, grim news and, you know, about made up death instead. <laughs> Now, I should explain as well, Pippa, for the, who don't know, she's been, if you've been following this, you'll have seen Pippa cropping up often in the comments because uh, she's been watching these series. But Pippa um, lives in Cambridge and she's part of a, um, a crime readers group called Crime Crackers who have been going for 18 years, who celebrated their 18th birthday, I think, pretty much last Thursday in lockdown. Is that right? That's right, yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> Not the best way to celebrate it, but uh, at least we were, we were able to celebrate. And you've discovered Zoom, presumably? We did. I think I was the only one who struggled with it, but um, my, my connection kept cutting out. <laughs> but, um, it, it was fun, it was interesting and a different way to do it. I dropped in on it, actually. I mean, people were very kind to pass the invitation to me. And it's great to see. I mean, I just think, presume, I, from what I gather, book groups all over the country are now meeting. You know, they've read the book. They're, they're going to meet come hell or high water. So everybody's turning up in this book. Did you find it very different? Uh, we talked a lot more about the book um, because it meant you couldn't have little side conversations. And so it was a lot more, more focused, which was really good. <laughs> because, yeah. you know, if you've got, we're quite often 18, 20 people and you get little asides going on and, you know, sub conversations. And it, it, so it was much better in a lot of ways and much more focused, but you just miss the actual people. I love that. I love the fact that actually you're forced to actually talk about the book a bit more for a change. The book <laughs> aren't necessarily entirely about the books, but anyway. Um, no, it's brilliant. And we'll talk a bit about some more, but I, I'll talk a little bit about... Um, Hold on, how can I get this in school? <laughs> uh, the cutting place. Um, it starts, I mean, it's a, it's a grisly tale in many ways. Isn't it? I mean, it's, 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 I'm afraid so. Dismembered body. Well, it's crime fiction. We hope it's grisly, to be honest. Um, there's, a, there's bits of a dismembered body turns up in the Thames, and we've used the very um, fashionable thing of mud mudlarking, which everybody seems to be doing in the Thames. And somebody discovers bits of the body, and they lead, they lead to a situation, you know, a, a kind of hidden world. Can you explain that a little bit? 
Um, yes, the the body parts are um, they turn out to belong to a young freelance journalist um, who has disappeared and is found floating in many parts in the Thames. Um, and she was investigating a gentleman's club. I mean, I say gentlemen, they're not really. They're rich, powerful, very privileged. Um, but really, they are just incredibly self-indulgent and they think they can buy their way out of any trouble. So she's trying to expose what they've been doing and ends up dead. And for my main character, Maeve Kerrigan, she has to infiltrate the club, find out what's going on there and find out if that is the reason that poor Paige ended up in pieces in the Thames. How did you dream up this? Did you dream up this Chiron Club or is it very much based? I mean, did you research it all of this kind of, you know, are there, are there how, how, much, how, much, how much fantasy and how much reality is there in that, in this gentleman's club that's at the heart of it? I mean, I don't know. I, like, I guess I'm slightly possibly inspired by the sort of people who are running the UK at the moment um, who are, you know, I, I actually went to Oxford and the Bullingdon Club is what all of the, the posh boys were members of. And I remember seeing them in passing in the street, getting ready to go hunting. So this is like going back as they had, they had hands, they had, they were in the full kiss. They were probably pretending to go hunting and it was a pub crawl or something, but it was all, they, they were living a totally different life from the rest of us. And I'm really interested in how people who are privileged think that, that they're entitled to that and that other people don't really matter. And they, they're brought up to believe that. So I wanted to write about these really horrible people. And, um, you know, it is, I hope it's far-fetched in, in the best possible way, because I hope that all the wealthy and powerful people are actually good and decent. Um, but certainly the people in this club are not. I'm going to take a brief pause to say hello to some people who've come up here. Kinea, uh, Sven from Germany. Hi, Sven, Susan, Sheila, Caroline, Barry. Um, Barry, who I last saw yesterday listening to a, a Peter May um, podcast. Anyway. And hi, Margaret, who says, lovely to hear you, Jane. <laughs> but, um, when you start with a character like, you know, I just wonder when you, when you start with a series and a character, um, and now over nine books of May Perrigan, uh, uh, and Joff as well. How how much do you know about them at the beginning, and how much they change? I mean, it seems to me that if you're writing that many books, surely the character will, you know, it must be a shock sometimes when you go and read some of the early books to find out what your character was. But they develop, presumably. And how do, how do you let them develop? That's a terrible question. Sorry. Oh no, it's not. I actually, I mean, I'm sure this is something because you write a series as well, so you're yeah. obviously dealing with the same the same thing. Um. I I think um, I know the characters really well by now because I've written about them for so long. So it's sort of like dropping in on a friend and you sort of catch up with them and see how they are and what's going on with them. And and um, playing around with how the characters relate to one another is like it's the whole fun of series fiction. So seeing them change and seeing their relationship deepen and seeing the trust grow or maybe be lost between the two of them. I mean, I just love it. I could play around with them all day. Did you know who she was as much as you do now, or was there space for her to grow, if you know what I mean? Um, I think uh, it's, I don't think she's changed a huge amount, actually. I think she's grown in confidence, um, and she has um, been promoted. I think that, that that's kind of a big thing that gives her a different set of challenges. Um, but I don't think that she has changed that much. I think Josh Derwin has changed hugely because she's had a really positive effect on him. So yeah. he's... He is her boss. Um, he arrived in the second book in the series. He's not actually in the first book. And in the second book, he's the most obnoxious character, like really above and beyond obnoxious, like the worst person in the world. And um, I thought he was only going to be in that book. So I was like very happy to make him into this kind of hate figure and to have him be really obnoxious and sexist. And then he turned up in the third book. So I started, I know it sounds ridiculous, but I started writing the third book and he was driving the car on the way to the crime scene. And I was thinking, what are you doing here? <laughs> but but he, he had arrived and um, ever since, like the relationship between them has grown. And that is definitely something that surprised me and something that I didn't see coming back and we in the like beginning. Him now. We like him, you see. Well, he's he's not... mellowed. Oh, yeah. I mean, his, I think he was like, I think the more you find out about him, the more you realise why he's so guarded in the first books. And that's, right. and like some of it, I mean, 
I look back on them and I think, well, how did I know I was going to need that? Yeah. But, you know, some, obviously the subconscious mind does a lot of the planning. It's like I choose to believe. I try not to think about it too much in case I can't do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, P Pippa, I mean, presumably you must have read now over that 18 years an extraordinary amount of crime books, let alone for the book group, but also... Mm -hmm. Um, yep. do, you have, do you have any idea how many books um, Crime Crackers have now read as a total? Oh, uh, probably we've missed about five, five or six meetings over the 18 years. So what, um, whatever. Oh, so it's yeah. 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 Is it monthly you meet? Yes. Yeah. And it's part, it's part of Heifer's Bookshop. It's, it, it's it is. We meet at, at Heifer's. And, Christmas time, we always read something light or silly or a children's crime, you know, sort of Emile and the Detectives or Nancy Drew or something like that and have a little bit of a party. And in the summer, we always go out for a picnic, um, oh. weather permitting. Otherwise, we sit in the basement at Heifer's and spread out the picnic rugs and what have you. But, uh, yeah, it's quite good fun. We used to go to people's houses at Christmas um, because there were, you know, sort of about eight or ten of us. But then when we got to be about 15, 20, it was too much. So, uh, But we used to make up silly games and uh, have quizzes and things like that at Christmas as well. Which, you know, so it's, it's quite good fun. And we've still got three of the founding members attending. So that's Amazing. quite good. I mean, I love book groups, and it's great. I, I think the the fact is that you've got this thing in the middle of the room that everybody spends at least five, six, seven hours preparing for. Well, theoretically, I did notice you haven't finished the book in the last one that you did. But anyway, in theory, everybody's read the book, so they've committed hugely to turning up to this event. And quite often, usually, people don't even know each other, or people have nothing in common with each other. But you've got this book in the middle of the table, so to speak, that sort of brings you all together. I mean, they're remarkable things, really, aren't they? Incredible. The worst thing you can do, though, is have a book that everybody likes. Yeah. That is the most boring meeting. Never, never pick Jane's books. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to ask, actually, how you pick the books. Who gets to decide who, what you're going to read next? Um, everybody throws in suggestions, and I keep a list, and then we go down it slowly to try and make sure we don't get five cosies on the trot or... You know, so we go through historical, psychological, golden age, modern, uh, foreign. So we've done Swedish, Icelandic, French, Italian, Spanish, Norwegian, Polish, and Japanese. Oh, excellent. <laughs> wow. Very good. I like that a lot. Mm. Uh, and actually, now listen, look at this, you see. This is also an author, an author about, it's called Cambridge, myriads of uh, mysteries, but it's about crime fiction set in Cambridge, of which yeah. there seems to be a ridiculous amount compared to Brighton, certainly. We just have Peter James and <laughs> Ellie Griffith. Isn't Peter uh, James enough? That's enough. I think he keeps it, the territory fairly close. I think, you know, he'd send the boys round if anybody else started <laughs> contemporary crime. But Cambridge does have a, a completely disproportionate amount of crime book set there by the look of it. I've got this book, and it, indeed it, it's true. Why? I think because you've got the town and gown thing and you've got the enclosed, um, you know, colleges, it, it, it's good, a good area for... Um, Killing people. Crime and, yes. They're not all uh, murders, no. um, but, you know, it's a bit of art theft and um, all sorts of other things, but um, mainly murders. But it, it, um, it's quite varied as well. I mean... But there's a lot of historical crime. Um, we started, it was sort of a discussion at the book group. And uh, then I changed jobs and I was really, really bored. And um, so we took off from there. But we're hoping to do a blog as well to keep it up to date. Because even yeah. since we published it, there is so much. Bloody writers, they keep writing more books. Oh, no. I can't well, keep up with part, the reading. Well, that's Jane's fault as well, because Jane, you teach people to write books as well, don't you? I mean, oh, you right. write <laughs> as well, don't you? Um, how do you mix the two? Is that quite hard? Um, putting a writing brain on it and then a, you know, because you talked about just earlier on about keeping the process quite unconscious. But when you're teaching, you've probably got to think it through quite a lot. 
Yeah, I mean, I don't, I, I teach a very small amount. I wouldn't say it's a huge sort of part of what I do because I, I do find it really difficult to kind of break down what I might do instinctively or maybe what I do, you know, incorrectly. I don't know. There, there's, I'm sure there's ways that you can always improve. But I used to be an editor. So I was, I was actually a children's books editor. And um, I think that is a very good training in thinking about why a story works right. and why it doesn't and why a character is appealing and why, you know, they, they don't quite hit the mark. So that's, that's sort of, um, that's my background and that's kind of my way into it. But I'm doing um, mentoring at the moment with the Killer Women group. I'm mentoring an absolutely brilliant young writer in London. Um, and it, it's really exciting. It's lovely to see someone who hasn't had the, opportunity to find out very much about the publishing world and even just explaining how how it works how a book deal happens and how how you get an agent like all these things that we sort of take for granted and actually it's quite mysterious for for a lot of people it's a very to outsiders it's the strangest world and actually to the insiders it's the strangest world yeah. I can't really imagine that when you you've got your hardback published that it's all going to be bells and whistles and things like that but it's quite a strange experience, isn't it, bringing our heart back? It's part of a huge, great process. And actually, the day the book comes out is just like kind of one moment in that. And actually, it's very often not a day because some bookshops, I don't know how heifers are, but you know, might have it a week beforehand. It's a kind of strange, you know, in so many ways, it's not what you expect it to be, is it? No, I mean, the cutting place is a really weird one because it came out early because I think they they knew that lockdown was happening and they knew that the sales were going to be different and that the bookshops weren't going to be operating so it actually came out at the beginning of April instead of just at the end of last week um so I've had kind of weeks of publication day like it feels it feels very weird to be doing all of this stuff from from home yeah. and, and having it going on and on and um in terms of um that do you does part of you think oh god I wish it couldn't have come out at a different time or would you just sort of think I'll get on with it. It's, it's very weird, isn't it, to have books coming out now? It is. I think if it was a standalone, I would be really worried right. because I would feel that it would just get lost and nobody would ever come back to it. But because it's in the series, um, I, I just know from the other books in the series, you know, people are still buying and reading the books that came out 10 years ago. Yeah. So that's that's the thing. You have a long tail. The books are still available. And that's the important thing, I think, is knowing that they, they won't just disappear into the ether. Um, and there's always the paperback. <laughs> whenever, whenever that happens, <laughs> we live in hope. <laughs> but uh, you know, you, you're a you're a Dublin-born writer. I think Dublin, aren't you? Yeah. And and Irish women crime writers at the moment, well, for several years now, seem to have been having quite a moment. I mean, I'm just trying to, you know, there's uh, Liz Nugent, um, Joe Spain, Sinead Crowley, Tana French, Olivia Kernan. Um, it's more right there. I keep forgetting. I wrote a list. Patricia Gibney is very big. Patricia Gibney is very successful. Yeah. Um, yeah. There are. There's Catherine Ryan Howard who has right. the most fantastic book coming up. I'm just going to have to give you a plug for it. It's coming oh. out in August. I've just read the proof, and it is called uh, The Nothing Man, and it is absolutely brilliant. It's about a true crime podcast. So I really could not be more up to date, um, but I highly, highly recommend it. Yeah, there's a, there's a huge number of us, um, sort of out of nowhere. I think Tana French was probably the most successful and the earliest, and then um, it's just sort of built from from her. Yeah. Um, I mean, there were there were others. I don't want to get in trouble. There were other authors before Tana French who were writing crime in Ireland, but she she was a massive success before anyone else. So. Um, but, um, you know, I suppose this is a really corny question. You shouldn't really ask any woman to sort of play it, but why so many women writers in, 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 that, in that genre? And also writing about, you know, women within that policing sort of world. It's obviously been, you know, it's, there's a timely thing going on. I'm not quite sure what it is, but, you know, it's certainly just, I mean, and obviously Irish people are, think of themselves as writers. I mean, it's not there's a good position there as well. But do you have any clues as to why such a volume of people coming through with such great work? Um, I mean, I think it, like success always breeds success. Like if you see someone else doing something, then you know that you can do it too. So like just even seeing someone succeed is a huge encouragement and makes you feel like you're not wasting yeah. your time. So there is that. I think that's why like representation is really important in crime fiction, um, that you have people from different backgrounds writing in it because otherwise we'll never get them. Like we'll, they'll just think, well, that's not for me. 
So I think it happened in Ireland. I think um, someone like Liz Nugent, who is so inventive, like has really exploded what's possible in the genre. I, I know that sounds kind of like I'm, I'm pitching it very high, but I'm not. Like she is so original. Um, mm. And so it feels like there's a, a lot of playing going on with what's possible within the genre. So that's that's really exciting. And I think that creatively everybody's kind of in on that. But I mean, Irish writing across the board is so, so important at the moment. You know, there's, there's um, uh, Nisha Dolan's new book is coming out that that's, um, it, it's literary, but it's, it's really clever. There's lots of people that are being experimental. And I don't know if it's just that Irish women haven't had that much of a voice. Um, like famously, there's a tea towel of Irish writers that they sell to tourists and there are no women on it. Yeah. So, um, because there are so many successful male writers, like the, you know, the Nobel laureates and all the rest of it. So we have to allow them to go on the tea towel. But there are so many women that maybe didn't get a voice before this. Now, the comments on, I get to see comments in the sort of right-hand panel and they froze for a long time and, and I thought everybody had gone off and then suddenly they just unplugged. Uh, and there's millions of them coming up here, including one from Susan Baines who has just realised there's a spot, specks on top of your head. I thought they were a new hairstyle. <laughs> <laughs> well, I did actually buy one of those electric razors because um, we are hard to come by, actually, but this hair in lockdown has been a bit of a nightmare all round for whichever gender, I think. But anyway, um, how are you all coping with the, with the, with the actual just day-to-day -day of being stuck in your houses? Pippa, how is it for you? It's all right. Um, lots of reading, escape to the garden every now and again, and think I really must do some more reading. Um, but yeah, we're getting there. How's about with, with you, Jane? Well, I mean, like, there's something very weird about how time moves in lockdown. Like every day seems to last about four hours and I get nothing done. And then each week lasts approximately 100 years. So I don't understand how that's possible. Like it feels like everything is incredibly slow moving and at the same time i get to the end of the day and if i've done the washing up i'm like pat on the back you know you've achieved something today and i've i bought a, a roll of lining paper you know like wallpaper lining paper and stuck it up on the wall so that everybody could draw in it and i write every day the day number and i realized it's saying day 34 now that was the day we were first asked before for proper lockdown stuff and it how did it ever get to be 34 days? I mean, I've got a feeling it's going to be 170 days and I'm not even going to notice they're passing. It's very strange. But are you getting any writing done in there? Um, yeah, I'm finishing off a book. Right. So uh, that's, And that's really a great way to get away from your family. If you say, I, look, I only have four chapters left. Just let me go and write it. And then you, you get to go and <laughs> hide somewhere um, and, you know, working. Um, I'm really close to the end. And so I'm really determined to finish it. And I thought I was going to finish it this weekend, and then I, I didn't. So I still have a bit bit to go. Yeah. I'm sorry for interrupting. But anyway, um, I mean, it, it, but you haven't had any. It's another world. You're not feeling. I mean, some some of the writers I spoke to said they're finding it very hard to write right now because everything is just so confusing. I would say I'm finding it exactly as difficult as usual to not yeah. be distracted, <laughs> and um, I think like. It, it's it's a different it's a different set of circumstances i think like the funny thing is this is the first time my family have had to live the way i do like for me lockdown is pretty much how i would go about my daily life if i was given the choice you know stay in work exercise briefly see people at a distance but really you know i i really like the company of my characters when i'm writing so um it's really the rest of them who are struggling <laughs> Um, I said, so asked the questions as well, and, and I realised they probably asked them ages ago. They're all right now. Sheila Bugler, who is an, an, another Irish writer living quite close to me down Hi, towards. Hi, Sheila. Um, she said she had a main character called Maeve, but her then Irish publisher said she had to change the name as people outside Ireland wouldn't be able to pronounce it properly, which I'm sure must happen actually. But have you had any issues with Maeve's name? No, but um, it auto corrects to move. So I sometimes get people oh, saying, yeah. So arrogant, I like that. And I, I get people saying, I just love Mauve so much. And I know, like, I know it's autocorrect. I know it's not that they don't know her name, but I just, it always makes me laugh. <laughs> but people don't always know how to pronounce it, which surprises me because to me, it seems like a very easy, I mean, there are more difficult Irish names, let's face it. Oh God, yeah, there are. And, and they're being, but maybe that's changing it as well. You know, I think people are becoming slightly more used to that, aren't they? I hope so. Um, um, and uh, in terms of reading, 
presumably you're on the end of a book, you're presumably not reading a huge amount. I don't know. Do you, do you read much fiction when you're finishing a book? Um, I'm trying to catch up with all the proofs I've been sent. So right. I, I have a big stack um, that I'm, I'm kind of working my way through. And um, I've just been reading, uh, I have to say, this one, which I just thought was amazing. Um, oh, yeah. Uh, I, huge I've book. Heard, I've heard so, such great things about it. We Begin at the End. We Begin we at the End by Chris Whisker. Oh. Absolutely brilliant. Like it really blew me away. Um, and Sarah, who's um, from America, said, hello, wondering if, James May Kerrigan novellas will ever be available in the US. Will only ever see them on Amazon UK. Um, my agent is working on it, even as we speak. It got left off a contract, is my understanding. So it's being added in. <laughs> I must say, I'm so impressed with the fact you're able to take your characters and do a series with you. Is that a big problem? Because that must be a real, I mean, they are your characters, and yet, you know, occasionally people have to change publishers for all sorts of reasons. Um, and it must be terrifying if you just have to think, oh, well, if I change publishers, I've got to start again from scratch. Yeah, I, I would find it really hard. I mean, I, I I might do another series at some point, and I'm working on a standalone at the moment, so that is different characters. But the thought of starting a whole new series and, and knowing what it entails and that I might be writing it in 10 years' time, I think it was actually helpful not to realise any of that at the beginning because, you know, I just didn't overthink it. I just wrote it and that was fine. So I would find it harder now, I think. Pippa, what are, what are Crime Crackers reading next then? Uh, we're going to read uh, McFinley's Arrowwood. Are you? Very yeah. good. Choice. And he's going to join us as well. So, Oh, that's a real pleasure. And I think Nick popped in as well. That's quite the yeah. world. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, lovely man and lovely book, actually. That's brilliant. And I see I've got this sl sl slightly sneaking jealousy because I've got a feeling that people are quite liking historical fiction now because the present is a bit too complicated. Uh, present scary. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I had, because I started on historical fiction and thought, oh, no, I want to be contemporary. And I'm thinking, oh, the world is really tricky now. But anyway. Are you, are you going to write about the coronavirus, do you think, William? Are you going to put it in a book? I, I'm not putting in the book I'm writing now, but I might have to backdate my book to 2019 because um, it's so huge, isn't it? I mean, I do love the idea of of um, trying to set an investigation during the coronavirus. I, I'm just trying to work out. I think it'd be a great plot. It's very much what Peter May's done. I mean, he'd already written the book, um, but that idea of how ev how everything's different. Like we're talking about how books are different now, but policing must be really really hard yeah my yeah. husband you know my husband is a special constable yeah so he's volunteering and he's going out and policing and he said the only people who are out on the streets are the criminals oh, so he every car they stop <laughs> is full of people they want to arrest it is shooting yeah. fish in a barrel yeah i didn't know he was a special constable. i said i was saying yes but i realized i knew he's he was involved in, in law but I yeah realize, oh okay wow oh That's... he's the compendium of criminal law he does everything from like arrests all the way through to appeals. You can ask him about that. <laughs> Vertically integrated. Yeah. He's, he's a one man legal band. That's great. But I imagine burglary works very low. But they're, and they're desperate. So they're burgling anything that they can they can get at. So sheds, um, charity shops, like any anything that they can they can lay their hands on. So yeah, no, it's can't... interesting. Our car has all been done in this. It's been a year, a long time since car theft because car theft became rather stupid. You know, people, you couldn't sell car radios anymore, but the cars are all being broken into now because yeah. there's nothing else to make. So people must be pretty much, that's not a very good note to finish this on. Um, no, well, I mean, I just think like when, when all this is over, maybe there'll be a massive drop in crime because all of the criminals would have been locked up because they were the <laughs> only ones out and about. So they'll be on lockdown and we'll be able to go out and enjoy ourselves. Yeah. Okay, I quite like that. Yeah, I'm never going to be worried now. Every time I go out, that I try not to look like a suspicious character. <laughs> Too bad. Yeah, I know. <laughs> um, listen, um, Jane Pippa, I try and wind it up at about half past, and we are 20 seconds away from half past, so I shall do it then. Thank you so much for um, taking time in the afternoon, and hope the new book goes very well. And congratulations on Cutting Place, and congratulations are on 18 years of Crime Crack. It's an amazing. Thank you very much. Yeah. Congratulations, Heather. Thank, Thank you. you, everybody, for um, dropping in, and I'm going to press the stop button now. So thanks again.